Hi there, Steve here. I'm <clears throat> sorry to be a couple of minutes late. You know, these um, systems like Google Hangouts. Um, Hi there, you know, like Steve that. here. I'm <clears throat> sorry to be a couple of minutes uh, late. Yeah. So I go, first of all, Google Hangouts or YouTube now has a new formula for live streaming. So every time I go there, I go to the beta first. I don't want to go to the beta. I don't want to learn anything new. So then, okay, go to the, uh, you know, old format. I'll find that. So I do that. And then, and then it comes on and asks, don't trust anything you get. Do you really want to trust? I say, yeah, I trust. And then I got a blank screen and then I have to get out of it and all this stuff. Unreal. Anyway, I guess in the end, it's all good stuff. It enables us to communicate. But uh, I think very often the programmers try to be too clever. Today I want to, uh, and so there's an issue there of control. Uh, we want to be in control of our destiny. And so when people, and I guess people can criticize Link for the same, when we come up with something new we think is better and people aren't used to it and may, in fact, it may not be better for many people, maybe better for some people, not for other people. So we feel we're out of control here. We had something that we felt we were in control of and now somebody else has done something to us. And uh, I find that the, um, you know, the classroom is a kind of is kind of like that. The classroom is essentially a space controlled by the teacher. Now, we are all on our 90 day challenge. We are in control. We're focused for 90 days to improve in whatever language. In my case, it's Arabic and Persian. And I decide what to do. And that's a great feeling. So, for example, I've decided that uh, because we have a week to go here, uh, formally, I guess the 90 days ends on the end of uh, the end of March, or the end of April, rather. So uh, that's going to be next Wednesday. And 30 days has September, April, June. Next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, it ends. So, uh, and I want to finish off with a video in Arabic and a video in Persian. So I want to prepare a bit. So I've decided I'm going to cut off my Persian for a while and focus in on Arabic. Try to get my level up, then have a discussion with someone in Arabic, which I will uh, video, and so people can assess my progress or lack of progress. And then I'm going to spend three, four days focused in on Persian, and then I'll do the same with Persian. So I decide what to do. Uh, I've also decided, because I was in my bookshelves here, I came across this book here called Complete Arabic. And uh, one of the good things to do in any language learning situation is to go back to the beginning. Go back to the beginning and if possible, if you go back, first of all, if you go back to the beginning stuff, in a way it's fresh because you haven't been there for a while. And second of all, if you go back over the beginning material with a different book or a different set of materials, that's also fresh. And so I decide to do that. So again, I make the decision. Um, but then I get into this book and, uh, you know, the things they do, like they'll spend, like I was listening to the audio this morning while making breakfast. And so they've got like I don't know, five minutes on telling time. So if I were in a classroom and the teacher decided we're going to work on telling time, like for the whole hour, we're going to just tell time. I'm not that interested in telling time. It'll come eventually. Uh, it's not a big part of what I want to achieve early in Arabic. Um, so, but the teacher would decide. Or another session in the audio, the audio, by the way, is available for uh, streaming on their website. So I, I don't know where I bought the book. Maybe I bought the book in London. And I can stream the audio off their website so I can stream it on my iPad so I can listen on my AirPods while it's being streamed on my iPad. And so it functions as listening material. So then they spend another good five minutes on numbers and, you know, 11, 12, 13, they say it twi twice. And they even have, I think this is extraordinary, this complete Arabic, teach yourself. They have English people, non-native speakers doing the Arabic. I think that's extraordinary. Uh, it's okay, whatever, but I, I think that detracts from the authenticity. Uh, at any rate, if I want to spend an hour on numbers, uh, I can do that, but I, typically won't. And if you're in a classroom, the teacher will say, today class, we're going to do numbers or we're going to do colors. And so the teacher gets to decide. 
And, and I think that's bad for learning. Now, maybe I'm just a bit of a rebel at heart. I still remember in grade four at school, we were in art class and I was drawing a hockey player because to me that was the most important thing in the world, a hockey player. So I drew the hockey player with hockey pants and with socks the way, you know, the hockey uniform is. And my teacher, art teacher was from Germany. And in Germany, they didn't know what a hockey player was. And since the, my hockey player was skating, she said, no, no, no. And she, over my hockey pants, she drew ski pants. And I still, to this day, from grade four, I remember that. How dare she impose her idea of what a hockey player should be wearing? And I kind of thought there, mm, whatever. You know, and I think this is a big issue, this issue of, of, of control. I often, on, uh, I think I've mentioned this. Oh, and I should say, by the way, that, that the book I often referred to by Manfred Spitzer, uh, Learning and the Brain. I mean, he makes the point. Learning doesn't take place in the classroom. It takes place in the brain, wherever the brain is. And uh, in fact, I tweeted, I said, the teacher's dilemma is that teachers in general are quite dedicated to helping their students improve. However, the most important thing is not what happens in the classroom. The most important thing is what the teacher does, excuse me, what the student does outside the classroom. Um, you know, I was at a, uh, a conference many years ago in Düsseldorf called Sprachen und Beruf, uh, learning or at least languages and professions. And studies show that in Germany, for every hour of instruction from a teacher, language teacher, companies pay for language teachers, the average student spends one hour, one hour a week. So for one hour in the classroom, they spend one hour on their own, on average. That's nothing. That's not going to achieve anything. The job of the teacher is to find a way for that student to spend 10 hours a week. And uh, by the way, when I'm in Ukraine, in, in Lviv, I'm going to be giving a talk to an IT, to a group of language teachers, presumably English teachers, that work for a large IT company in Lviv. And I'm also going to focus on that, that your job as teacher, it's, it's not so much what you are able to teach in the classroom. It's to what extent are you able to motivate your students to go out and listen and read and do things on their own and decide what they're interested in listening to and reading. And if they're interested in numbers or telling the time, fine, they can focus on that sometime. And uh, But if they're interested in something more relevant to their work, then that's what they should go after. And they should go after that and listen and read outside the classroom. Uh, I think one of the real failings of our education system is this idea that the teacher, and it's on both sides, it's both the teacher and the student. The student says, teacher's going to teach me. And the teacher thinks, I'm going to teach them. And really, the job of the teacher, at least insofar as languages is concerned, is to motivate them. Because any explanation of the language, any resources about the language are abundantly available. So how can you guide, encourage, stimulate the student to really go after the language? That's the task. And uh, it's funny. You know, you see this in so many different ways. The, again, on Twitter, some teacher says, you know, my language class is not about teaching the Spanish subjunctive. It's about teaching social justice. Well, you may think that's important, but I'm the learner. And if I think learning about the Spanish subjunctive is important, or if I think watching Colombian telenovelas is important, then that's what I want to do. It's not for you to dictate what I should be learning about. And, and when it comes, again, this comes up not only in language instruction, you hear it all the time, they're going to teach critical thinking. No, the more you know about a subject, the better your critical thinking ability. So the better you can read, and the more widely you read, the better you're able to make your own assessment, judgment about different situations. It's not up to the teacher to impose their assessment, their judgment, their subject, their timetable. So admittedly, maybe I'm a bit of a rebel, but I think that's extremely important that both the teachers and the learners understand that at least when it comes to language, and probably not only language, but particularly language, where there's such an abundance of grammar information and language content and so much stuff, audio, rich, video, music, there's so much stuff out there that the task of the 
the, the teacher is to persuade the learner that the key is not what happens in the classroom. The key is what happens outside the classroom. Now, this means that teacher has to recognize the limit of their role and has to limit the amount of control that they want to exercise over the students and allow the students the independence and encourage them to be independent, to go out and explore. Like I hear that there are teachers who won't let the students go forward in the textbook. You know, we haven't covered that yet. You can't watch, you can't go there. You know, the student has to be encouraged to go forward, to go backward, go back to the beginning, jump ahead, explore the language. So uh, today, so anyway, we're in our last week. I'm focusing, I spoke Arabic yesterday. I thought I did better than I have been because I was a bit focused in. I've got another uh, Arabic conversation at noon today. I'm gonna be focusing in on Arabic till about Wednesday or Thursday when I will do a video in Arabic, talking to one of my tutors. And then I'm gonna focus in on Persian, do a video on Persian, and then I will have completed my 90 day challenge. So with that, I will have a look and see what sorts of comments we have. And we can carry this conversation. And people like my glasses. I like them too. I bought them in Lisbon. It was a rainy day. I forgot my $10 or 10 euro glasses at the hotel. We were wandering around, uh, I can't tell you, near the uh, Bairro Alto. And there was a, you know, a shop there selling glasses. So I went in there with the intention of buying another cheap pair of glasses so I could read the menu at the restaurant. And the person there persuaded me that this was the way to go. So that's what I did. And these were like 70 euro, which is a lot more than I was intending to spend. On the other hand, I enjoy them very much. Now let's open this up and uh, see what sorts of questions there might be. Okay. So blah, 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 blah. Second place to the bang. I'm waiting. You aren't helping me. You're so bad at advising. Uh, the title of the video is quite strong. We do learn languages in classroom, especially when the classroom is our only source of comprehensible input. Now, why would the classroom be the only source of comprehensible input? The likelihood in the classroom is that the teacher may or may not be a native speaker. The other students are not native speakers. Anything you look at in the classroom, a book, or if you listen to uh, audio, it's all come from somewhere else. The, the, there is an abundance, an absolute abundance of um, input everywhere. If you're using Link, you can bring it in and look up the words and phrases. You can uh, find uh, podcasts, which you can transcribe. There is also an abundance of material with both audio and text. So I don't understand Gustava uh, Pamplona here saying that the classroom is the, if you consider the classroom your only source of comprehensible input, you are not sufficiently independent. You need to take more initiative. Hey, is it true that the more languages you learn, the easier learning the next language becomes? If so, why? Khalifa al Khalifa. I have found that to be the case. And uh, I'm not an expert, but I would say that the reasons are the following. So when we are born, we can learn any language, it doesn't matter. You could be born to a Mongolian, you can be born to an Indonesian, to a Swahili speaker. Then if that's the environment, those are your parents, those are your friends, your brain will gradually form around that language. Initially, it's completely flexible. It's a free for all. By the time we're six or seven, the brain starts to get a little more rigid and it's optimized for whatever language we were surrounded by. Now, when we learn a second language, we are now introduced to new sounds, new structures, new ways of expressing things. So initially, with only one language, that's very difficult. But once you have been able to create some space in your brain for that language, the new sounds, the new ways of expressing things, then the third language, now, you are already a little more flexible. So you don't find some other way of expressing things strange. You have a wider range of sounds. So your brain becomes more uh, able to assimilate, to integrate a new language. And that's point number one. Now, I'm not a neuroscientist, but that's the way I see the process in the brain. The second thing is, because confidence is such a big factor in language learning, 
until you have actually achieved fluency, achieved fluency in one language, you really don't think you can do it. Now, once you've done it once, now you're confident. So after I had achieved fluency in French, I had no doubt that I could learn Chinese. There's no doubt in my mind. A friend asked me when I was assigned by the Canadian government to go to Hong Kong to learn Mandarin. He said, but yeah, but what if you fail? That thought had not entered my mind. I had learned one language, I can learn another language. So your confidence is greater. And the third thing is you have a better sense of how to go about it. I discovered with French, and this was reinforced with my Mandarin learning, that you need to read and listen a lot. That more than any explanations that you're going to forget or not understand or whatever, you know, grammar tables that you won't ever remember, it's that reading and listening. So I, I had a method, I had the confidence that I could do it, and I think my brain had become a little more flexible. So that is the answer to that question from Khalifa. Hi, Steve, big fan and inspiring learner from Russia. Just want to say, hi, Andrew. Yeah, you know what? I had a great time in Russia and I want to go back. And, you know, I'm a great fan. Like, I, I believe the one thing about languages, we learn them, we lose, uh, you know, I saw a quote, someone in Britain saying that Britain is an exceptional country and it's very pessimistic to say we're not exceptional. Every place is exceptional. There's nothing exceptional, not about the United States, Britain, not about Russia. But all are equally exceptional and all are equally, you know, exciting to learn about as I'm learning now about Arabic countries and Persia. But I really enjoyed being in Russia and I saw so little of it. I only saw St. Petersburg and Moscow and I would like to ex explore more of that country. Um, Giova, now how can I improve my speaking? All right. To improve your speaking, it's kind of like two things. You want to build up your potential to improve. But then, to really improve, you have to speak a lot. What do I mean by that? All right, to improve your potential, you have to have words. First of all, you have to understand. Because if you're going to get involved in meaningful conversations with people, you have to understand what they're saying. So you have to build up your vocabulary. You have to build up your listening comprehension. Therefore, you have to read and listen a lot comes a point there where now you're you're bursting at the seams you want to start trying to use what you learned even though you won't remember much of it like yesterday i spoke in arabic and i was searching for words that i know i have but i couldn't find i couldn't remember the words but i'll do it again and again and again and i'll get better and better and better at retrieving the words that i have already socked into my comprehensive you know passive vocabulary i understood most of what my Arabic tutor was saying, I had trouble finding the words that I needed. Eventually, you have to speak a lot. Speak a lot without worrying. Now, obviously, that's easier with a tutor because the, I'm paying the tutor. He has to listen to me or she, whoever it might be. Eventually, you get out and talk to people who you are not paying and who are not your friends. There, it can be a little more stressful, but you just have to focus on communicating and speak as much as you can. All right. How can I improve my speaking? No, oh, I lost, I pressed the wrong button here. Now that wasn't very good. Let's see if I can get back to it. Uh, uh, excuse me here. I pressed something on my iPad, which knocked me out of, there I was. We'll get back in there. Okay. Uh, da, 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 where are we now? How can I improve my speaking? Okay. How can I deal with low motivation? I'm committed and determined to learn new language, but there are constantly mood swings which arise, make me unmotivated to currently. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we all have swings in our motivation. Uh, one good thing is to just, because we're all creatures of habit, if, if I, I'm in the habit, if I'm doing any task around the house, I go and search for my AirPods and I start listening. So, and when I listen, then there are parts that I don't understand and that motivates me to go and read it up on link so that the, a lot of it is triggered by the listening. So if you have the habit, of listening whenever you have an opportunity, that's gonna create some curiosity that'll make you wanna read that text. So I'm always dealing with audio for which I have the transcript and I can read it on link and look up words, review the words. So the audio triggers the curiosity. Also reading a text or hearing certain, you know, for example, the verbs in Arabic, which is completely confusing and, you know, you plural, male and female, you plural, female, you plural, male, and trying to remember the ending for the past and the present, very complicated. Every so often I get curious, I look it up. So it's that you have the habit of listening, which then causes you to go to the text, 
Then you see things that you want to, once again, look at the rule. How does that really work or a table? And then you go to the grammar table. That's kind of how I maintain my motivation. Isn't it always comprehensible because teachers, most of them learned in the traditional way grammar is the only source. Now. Yeah, Matthias is right. Like, unfortunately, a lot of the classrooms are based on grammar instruction. And uh, so the teacher decides today, I'm going to teach the class, whatever it might be, the subjunctive or case endings in Russian or something. All of that teaching is of limited benefit unless the students have already had a lot of exposure to those structures through a lot of listening and reading. So very often the instruction doesn't achieve an awful lot. The teacher then can test them on it and if it's just been taught at them, they may even answer correctly. But uh, two weeks later they won't be able to do it if they haven't developed the necessary habits through lots of listening and reading. What is my mother tongue, says Jayesh. Okay, well, the language that I speak most naturally is English. When I was born in Sweden, so for the first five years of my life, the language I spoke most easily was Swedish. But when we moved to Canada, I was uh, five years old, we transitioned. We spoke only English at home. I transitioned to English. I went out to play with kids, five-year-old, in the neighborhood. I have no recollection of ever having any difficulty communicating. Obviously, I must have spoken with an accent, but we were just kids, and pretty soon I'd forgotten my Swedish, and the only language I could speak was English. Uh, da, da, da. But seeing things over and again after long makes you see things from another perspective. Yes, Roman. Uh, how do you find content for target language? I'm here. Which target language, okay? In the case of Arabic, um, we, I had to create these mini stories, so I paid to have someone translate them from English, record them. Same with who is she. So that's created our Arabic, some of our Arabic content. Members of Link have added a, a whole bunch of other content for Arabic. Um, Persian, same thing again. We created that content. Then I paid for some other people to create some content. Then I found Persian online. I Googled. Persian, sometimes I'll Google in the target language, uh, you know, in languages that are easier, like when, with Polish, I wanted to find audiobook and ebook on Polish history, the same with Ukrainian. I just Google in Polish, in Ukrainian, I find the content I want, I import it into Link. So the other thing you can do is ask on our forum at Link. Ah, okay. How do you find? Okay, I, I see the word. Uh, I'm going to do Turkish. I don't understand what you've written there, but uh, my schedule is basically, okay, I'm going to Ukraine, so I want to work a month on my Slavic languages. I want to get a little better at cases and verbs and stuff like that. Then I want to work on my Korean because I'm going to Asia in the fall. Then I'm going to get back into Persian and Arabic and probably add Turkish because there's obviously a real cultural, linguistic, historical link between the Arabic language, the Persian language, and the Turkish language. And that's part of my exploration of that part of the world. Uh, hey, Matthias, you cannot generalize it. All teachers work. No. What is the best manner to teach second language for children? Obviously, it depends on the age of the children. I mean, I have a friend in Montreal, uh, Tetsu, whose father is from Taiwan, Chinese. Mother is Japanese. His wife now he is Japanese. He lives in Montreal. So he has a strategy. He, he and his father speak to his kids in Chinese. His mother and wife speak to the kids in Japanese. The children go to French school in Quebec. They live in Quebec. They have a Spanish-speaking nanny from Mexico. What do we got there? Chinese, <laughs> Chinese, Japanese, French, English, Spanish. So that's one way of doing it. And these are young toddlers. Um, you know, I haven't had to deal with that. I tried to get my kids to learn languages. They resisted. You can't get people to do things that they don't want to do, including your children. So I have no further wisdom on this. I think he's put out a bunch of information on this subject. Uh, one person, I think he calls it one person, one language. So that in the family, but personally, I couldn't do that. Like we all speak the same language.
you know, e even though I can speak other languages, my wife can speak other languages, in terms of our family environment, we speak one language. Anyway. Uh, hello, I'm from Peru. I'm a Spanish native speaker and English is my second language. I'm now motivated to learn French. Okay, so Corina, Isabel Valderrama, for a Spanish speaker to learn French, on the one hand, you have most of the words. Once you understand how they switch, it's a bit like Spanish and Portuguese, that what they call the, the lexical proximity, the similarity in words between French and uh, Spanish, is over 80%. English and Spanish is 50%, by the way, because there's lots of Latin origin words in English. Uh, so you have the words. It'll be easy for you to remember the vocabulary. That's the good news. The bad news is that French, you know, it, it's a bit like Spanish speakers learning Portuguese. You have to accept that it's a different language. You have to get out of your Spanish pronunciation. You have to really try to project yourself as a French person, a French speaker and really tune in to how they're pronouncing the words. For example, the E at, at the end of a word is not E, it's E. That's one of the very common mistakes that speakers of Italian or Spanish make when they speak French. You know, uh, instead of saying, uh, you know, je, they say je. Instead of say, saying uh, prendre, they say prendre, like the, the E becomes an E. The E is an important part of French pronunciation. Uh, so you have to really listen to the language, uh, get used to some of their phrasing. There are some differences in grammar. So if you're prepared to really plunge yourself into French and not hang back in your comfortable Spanish environment, uh, you can learn the language quite quickly. But it's not so easy because it's, you know, the, the, the words flow together. I mean, every language seems as if it's spoken very quickly by the native speaker. Spanish does to non-native speakers, but in French, it's like everything kind of blurs together. So you do have to do a lot of listening. Um, da, 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 stop in English, assistant us as videos. Good. If you think learners will learn faster, if the teacher, instead of talking, sorry, start again. Okay. Do you know how much do link tutors charge to make a private mini story less than about 15 minutes for you? We pay, we have, now, many of our mini stories have been provided free by volunteers, where we are, we're unable to get volunteers for what we consider major languages, supported languages, we have paid. And I think we pay $4, we have paid four or $5 a lesson for both the translation and the recording. Now, if it's a new mini story, um, in other words, if you want your tutor to do something, you'd have to negotiate with the tutor. It's, it's I would presume you pay the same amount as you pay per hour for a lesson. What's up, Steve? Okay. I wish my tutors revealed to me that the secret is not memorizing the vocabulary. Actually, it's all about enjoying the language in my free time and living it. Yes, Andy C. Z. Charles Paul, in schools, shouldn't they implement a language learning foundations course? Uh, they should. Like, I would, I missed one and I'll go back to it. But Charles, I agree. I think they should, they should have language learning experts in schools. Not necessarily someone with credentials in Spanish, French, Chinese, but someone with who has really studied language acquisition and can help students learn any language. Like, why would you say, well, we can't offer Chinese at this school because we don't have an accredited uh, or a credentialed Chinese teacher? You don't need a credentialed Chinese teacher. There's so many resources on the web. What you need is a person who understands how to learn in the 21st century how to stimulate learners, how to get them to do things, help them find resources. People ask, where do I find content? Help them find content. In other words, a language learning class, uh, telling students how to learn and letting them go out and learn whatever language they want to learn, rather than, as is, in, as is the case in Canada, imposing French on them. You must learn French, or in the US, presumably Spanish. I don't want to say I don't want to learn French. I want to learn Swahili. Here's where you find Swahili resources and then work with and help them and find dictionaries and all of this kind of stuff. That's my answer to you, Charles. Now, oh, here it was. Do you think learners will learn faster if the teachers, instead of talking, listen, well, I think there is evidence that uh, where the classroom, where the learners are allowed to read in the classroom, 
where they allowed, are allowed to listen in the classroom, uh, that they do as well or better. There was an example in New Brunswick, which is uh, a bilingual province in Canada. Uh, in the French language system, they didn't have enough money to hire an English teacher. So they made a bunch of audiobooks and books available to the students. The students could choose what they wanted to listen to and read, and that's all they did. And after two years, those students did better, not only in comprehension, but also in speaking. They had advanced more quickly than the students in the more structural, structured formal class. Think about it. Just by choosing what they wanted to listen to and what they wanted to read, on their own, those kids ended up learning faster than the kids in the structured classroom. Uh, now, so true. I learned English from movies, games, TV series. Yes, was able to follow the lyrica. Cadena tengo una lyrica. Lyrica de inglés, de árabe, de otras lenguas. Yeah, lyrica. If I understand it correctly, there's there's a music to each to each language. There's an intonation to each language. There is the the sort of inherent genius of that language to express things a certain way in Japanese, in, uh, in Russian, in French. And you kind of get in tune to that and you enjoy it. That's part of what makes the language fun and, and it's the beauty of the language. Uh, so some languages may sound more beautiful to people who don't speak them. So if you listen to Dutch, you might say lots of you know harsh sounds. But I'm sure if I started learning Dutch, I would find this intrinsic cleverness and beauty in the way the Dutch language expresses things. Um, yeah, here's uh, Annette Andy Cizette again. I had a few teachers that hated if I read it in a textbook. Yeah, that, I mean, that is just ridiculous. Teachers do that all the time. Don't read ahead. I'm the only source of knowledge here. I will tell you what to learn. You can't learn on your own. Uh, not very clever. Uh, I, uh, Roman says teachers should teach us to learn independently. Yes. I've been teaching English for 31 years. If the teacher has 15 students in a classroom, the teacher may need 15 different course plans to meet the needs of each student. That's a big challenge. Uh, no, maybe you don't need a course plan, period, Jair. Maybe you don't need a course plan. There's the language. There's books, there's audio, go to it. What course plan? Uh, in addition to motivation, feedback and answer questions also counts in language teaching. Yeah, where the students want the feedback, absolutely. Encouragement, feedback, answering questions, but also the students should be encouraged to figure out where they can get their own answers. So rather than asking, you know, how do I say this in Portuguese? This, I presume Jair is from Brazil. How do I say this in Portuguese or uh, some issue of grammar? The student, if the goal of the teacher is to make the student independent, the student should be shown where they can find that information. Like there are online dictionaries, there are online grammar resources. The teacher needn't be the only source of wisdom about the language. Why is it that when I listen and read my brain tingles from the front to the back, I don't know? And that, Andy, do I get tired when I don't understand? No, no, I consider it normal not to understand. Uh, sometimes, obviously, it's it's fun to go back to easier material where you understand it all, but then I find it challenging to go to more difficult period, uh, material where I struggle, and then I'm tired of that, and I go back to easier material, it, but it essentially doesn't bother me. ASMR, okay. I will look that up. If it happens when you concentrate intently on sounds, it could be ASMR. How much time does it take? Oh, somebody asked me about 100 links a week. Uh, ah, been making 100 new links a day for the past week. Think this is too few links for starting a new language? No, 100 links a day is good. Daniel Johnson, good. That's very good, 100 links a day. But I, I don't set myself a goal I want to make 100 links a day. I just get at some content and start linking. And uh, so it, it's, again, I'm sort of motivated by my interest in the language, in attacking new material, in learning new words, and I don't necessarily set myself a goal. Mm. 
No. How much time does it take to get second language to the level of my native language? You will never get your second language to, to the level of your native language. That's not a realistic goal. Uh, how long does it take to achieve fluency in a language? It depends on the language. It depends on how fluent. Uh, I prefer to focus on just enjoying the language and just seeing how far I can get. In the case of English, just having a mainstream accent, British or American, important to sound fluent. Okay. Um, to my mind, fluency is not related necessarily to the accent. Uh, I know many non-native speakers of English who are extremely fluent and who have an accent. Uh, as to whether it's a mainstream accent, I don't know what the reference to mainstream accent is. Uh, in other words, if you have an Australian accent, that's fine too. If you have, um, I don't know, Irish, Scottish, it's all good. Or if you have an accent that's identifiably not native speaker, that's also fine. The fluency is more about how you use words. Reading books and watching movies with subtitles can be interchangeable. I mean, either reading or watching and noting down words and phrases that you don't know. Well, the trouble with movies is that it's, you know, you got to sit there in front of the TV or in front of the movie, uh, the screen. Uh, the advantage of listening is you can be anywhere while listening. Reading, of course, you also have to sit down. But I find that reading, where you have no visuals, you're just relying on the words, is, to me, more powerful. But if people like movies, then that's good, too. And uh, watching movies with subtitles in the target language is also a good thing to do. Okay, uh, R-E-3-I-R-T-H, finally hit a breakthrough in Japanese, understand the media, it took about one year. You know what, Th that's a great comment because I've often said that learning languages is like a snowball. So, and, and or I've said, you know, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The more words you acquire, the more familiarity you have with the language, the more interesting material you can access. This person can now access the media and that's gonna accelerate his learning. It's going to make the learning more enjoyable. It's going to ensure that he or she stays with it so that we just, there's this increasing momentum as we, as we acquire more words and more familiarity with the language. Yeah, I mean, uh, teachers. All uh, teachers that I've met have been very dedicated. I just wish they would encourage more independence on the part of the learner. I have asked you many times, but you didn't help me about how to start my day learning French at beginner level and English at intermediate level. Well, I mean, <laughs> If it were me, I'd simply get into Link and I find content of interest. And depending on my mood of the moment, uh, I do one language or the other. And uh, if I'm a beginner in French, then I will do beginner material in French. Uh, it's no different than what I did with uh, Persian and Arabic. You have to explore each language on its own. Uh, I decided in the case of Persian and Arabic that I would go the first half of the week in Arabic and the second half in Persian. That was my decision. Uh, I find that there's less interference that way. So I might suggest to you that you decide to split your time up that way. You could also go three months on one and three months on the other. It's going to depend on what you are most comfortable doing. Not to listen if you begin without looking at paper you listen from. Uh, yeah, I do a lot of that. Uh, I might initially listen and read at the same time, but most of my listening is without having anything in front of me because that, that's where I get in most of my learning time is doing other tasks, driving, exercising, cleaning up and listening. Um, Okay, how would you compare the difference between Spanish and, Port Spanish and Portuguese and Mandarin and Cantonese, which is greater? 
Um, I would say that the difference between Cantonese and Mandarin is greater. The uh, in the following way, there are if you are dealing with a newspaper article, formal text, there is very little difference between written Cantonese and written Mandarin. Uh, the pronunciation of Cantonese, the pronunciation of the very same character, very same word, is is so much more different. It's it, the difference between the Mandarin and the Cantonese pronunciation is so great that a Mandarin speaker cannot understand the Cantonese reading the same text cannot understand what the Cantonese speaker is saying or understands very little uh, so that the mutual intelligibility between Cantonese and Mandarin is is not as great but the vocabulary is essentially the same except for five ten percent of everyday slangy type conversation but for the bulk of if you listen to a podcast from Hong Kong on history most of the words used are words that also exist in Mandarin M somewhat different usage at times but overwhelmingly the same vocabulary very similar pronunciation very different and then everyday language again quite different Portuguese and Spanish like Portuguese speakers typically can understand Spanish uh, I think Spanish speakers can understand the Brazilians more easily than they can understand the Portuguese from Portugal. But when I was listening to Portuguese podcasts uh, from Radio Portugal, it was not uncommon that the Portuguese interviewer would interview a Spaniard. He would ask his question in Portuguese. The Spanish speaker would answer in Spanish. The audience were all Portuguese speakers and they understood what the Spaniard was saying that would not happen to the same extent. So I would say that, it, it, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not exactly the same, but, but Portuguese is closer to Spanish than Mandarin is to Cantonese. <sighs> Hi, from uh, Shenyang. I talked about this before, but please talk to Mark about enabling link available to Chinese students without needing a VPN. Ah, I, I will follow up on that and maybe Eric uh, here can remind me. Uh, I don't know what the technical issues are. We have spent a fair amount of time on China and it hasn't worked out. So we'd love to do something in China, but uh, there are technical issues. Steve. Thank you. Think of another question to ask the following person. I found this game stimulating. Okay, good. Uh, I don't know when the 90 day challenge is. If it's over, I'll stop making these videos. I thought it had to go to the end of the month. Well, I mean, uh, Yerdos, I talk all the time about language teaching methods. You'll have to go through my videos. Well, Gherkin, wherefore, I'm studying in high school in the U.S. and I've thought about creating a language learning club to help people. How would you go about that? Well, you know, I think sharing, the big thing is sharing your interest and your enthusiasm. Second thing is sharing resources, all the different, uh, uh, you know, sources of content for different languages, different learning methods, it's like a language cleaners club, budding polyglots club, and you share everything that you all know about where, where to find uh, resources to help you and how to use them. Okay, uh, I had a Korean teacher explain the linguistics behind the pronunciation. I have never found that helpful, but everyone is different. Finally made one of these rests here from his I think my earlier posting is I'm using link to respond to love it. Comprehensible input is the way. Ross Bagley, thank you. Started FSI Spanish, even though it's a bit dry. I see it as a new, fresh approach to my existing method, which is randomness. Okay. Hi, Steve. I want to ask you about English Life School. I have signed in and have arranged a plan depending on language foundation improving their skills. Fine. You said you pay people to create content for you in Arabic. As an example, what kind of content they create for you and what do you want them to create? Amir, okay. What we created initially was simple stories, the mini stories at Link. 
what I would love to have in Arabic, and not only for Arabic, but because I'm learning Arabic, two kinds of content. One, two Arabic speakers. Now, I realize this is a bit artificial because people don't normally speak to each other in Fusha, in, in the standard Arabic. But if two people would speak to each other in standard Arabic and then transcribe it, so you have a natural conversation and then it gets transcribed. <clears throat> because typically, if people speak to each other, they use less difficult words. And it's natural, it's, it's engaging. So that kind of con. So simple dialogues, simple dialogues about everyday life, what you're doing at work, at school, the kids, uh, even politics, economics, a series of 20 dialogues, 20 dialogues in, in Arabic, in standard Arabic. Eventually we could do the same in, in Egyptian Arabic or in Levantine Arabic. That'd be one kind. The other kind would be, and this could apply to other languages as well. The other kind would be, you know, the Arab world, all right? So sort of discussions like, let's say five minute, five, max 10 minute, almost like simplified lectures on different aspects of Arab civilization. Before Islam, uh, Andalusia, Baghdad, Tunis, Saudi Arabia, the colonial period, the modern period, politics, the whole thing, covering a whole bunch of different subjects, economics, uh, society, religion, uh, but simplified. This then would be intermediate content that could then lead me to having an easier time with Al Jazeera. So that was for Amir. Hi there, if anyone is interested in learning Thai, you can take a look in channel I made us the video. Okay, we may get, may get, we'd love to have Thai at link, by the way, if you would help us create content for Thai. So yeah, in school, in university, they give you homework and you must do the homework. And of course the homework, you do learn something by doing the homework. Um, the problem is, you know, there's so much uh, things we can learn if we go at it independently, but then we don't get credit for it. And so as a student, you are obliged to focus on doing things that, that, the, that the teacher asks you to do, because you need those for your marks. So it's a real struggle. I think you, you, what I would do is I would do what I'm assigned by the teacher, but my interest in the language would inevitably, inevitably drive me to do more listening and reading. Uh, well, Amir, I'd have to see a sample. I'd have to hear a sample of your audio, and we can discuss that separately. You can send me an email, steve at link.com. Uh, Malaysian fan here. How do you learn new language without forgetting the languages that you have learned? Uh, Matt, Azrin, I don't forget them. I don't forget them because I learned them through massive input, and therefore all of that remains. I have difficulty starting up again, trying to speak, but very quickly I catch up to where I was before and move ahead. Uh, okay, HiSig for the Hanza. I have never used it. My son Mark used HiSig for Japanese. Uh, no comment, I don't know, but you have to find something that works for you in order to learn the characters, because only when you have the characters can you, uh, you know, obviously read, and reading is key to learning. By watching YouTube videos, my reading articles and stories on the internet all the time, I learn grammar and sentence structure at school, but vocabulary I learned on my own, okay? Th yeah, uh, but we can also learn grammar and sentence structure just through lots of listening and reading and occasional reference to grammar, but we can also learn it at school, Petra. But it's the education that demands to follow a curriculum and to have quantitative results, great. So it's not always up to the teacher. This is true, Maria, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Steve, I always said that you're learning. Okay, hi, Steve. Toughest challenge learning Mandarin is the characters, basically. That's the hardest. It's not tough, it's just a lot of time. And as quickly as you learn them, you forget them. And you have to keep relearning, relearning, relearning. There again, lots of reading is a big help. Listening and imitating isn't that an effective way of getting into a language? Yes, yes. 
Hi, I'm Mexican. I'm struggling with my Japanese studies and I'm thinking if I should focus more on the vocabulary, if that would help me not get stuck as much when I try to read the sentence. Any advice? I mean, fire a pan 90, you, the brain has to get used to the language. So you struggle, you struggle, you struggle, but the more you listen and read and listen to things for which you can f get the text, that's how you're gradually going to get used to the language. And struggle to struggle is normal. And I, I wouldn't necessarily focus on vocabulary as sort of in isolation from content. I think you got to, again, as we do at Link, re, I, I study, then I, I, I read, I listen, I review the words a little bit, I turn the page, I continue doing the same. And I know that eventually I will learn the language. Do you think that being interested in just one or two things about the language, history and culture are enough to keep the motivation up during our learning? Do we need more reasons? Uh, I mean, for me, that's enough. Uh, obviously, if you meet people that you want to communicate with or because, I mean, history and culture, that's a pretty broad range there. OK, how many how many books have you read in Russian approximately? Yeah. You know, including short stories like Chekhov and, uh, you know, um, uh, I play like uh, Bez Pridanitsa, Yama, Atsidieti, uh, Anna Karenina. What have I forgotten? I like the classics, by the way. I don't know, five or six, I would say. I struggled a bit with the Master and Margarita. Yeah, five or six. I have lots more that I want to get to, but. Uh, pretty soon I wander off into other languages. I think learning in a library is more effective than in a home and way more effective in a classroom. It's just better for focus. What do you agree? Actually, learning in a, li a library is probably very good for focus. Uh, if you are alone at home, it's more easy to be this. It's easier to be distracted. Uh, I find sitting in an airplane is a great place to learn because for whatever reason, these public spaces seem to get me to focus more. Uh, what perfect steps? Oh, well, you know, I've been through the different steps to learning so often. Uh, reading does help, especially bilingual books. Okay, I'm not a fan of bilingual books because uh, I find it distracting to constantly have to read the other language. But um, whatever people enjoy. Hi, uh, Steve. Uh, uh, also, how do you think, how many books a language learner needs to read to achieve the advanced level? I can't say, but the more the better. And I would add audiobooks to the reading. Uh, I think audiobooks are tremendous. And, and uh, so my favorite sort of activity when I get past the intermediate stage is to import an ebook into Link. I get the audiobook, which I don't divide up into audio files for each lesson at Link. I just listen to it. Uh, but then I go through the ebook, learning the words and phrases. Um, what was the question again? How many do, do, to read? How many? Do, I don't know how many, but the first book you read, and now away from the computer on your own, that's a milestone. Everyone should read a novel. Oh, yes, audiobooks. I know some people who claim to be quite fluent in French. I gave them as a gift an audiobook, a French novel. They claimed they couldn't understand it. So I think you want to get to where you can not only read a book, but you can also understand an audiobook. And particularly in the case of Russian, again, it varies, but some of the audiobooks are so good. It's so it's such a pleasure to listen to them. Uh, some if you don't like the voice, if I don't like the voice of the audiobook, you just put it away. I'm from Tunisia, we call slang derja. Derja. How can I make my learning more and more effective? Well, lots of listening and reading. Uh, Keith in DNU, whatever DNU is. How can I do that? Kenyan girl, lots of listening and reading. Kenyan girl, Dnipro. Uh, Keith Hamilton, uh, yes, I'm arriving in Dnipro on the evening of the 16th of May, and I stay there till the 19th, leaving the 19th morning, going into the Donbass area. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Salamat Malam, sir. I'm learning English for a long time, but still I'm not fluent. How can I achieve my goal? Just keep going. There is no magic pill. By watching Galileo, da, 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 but my listening has improved. But how can I improve my speaking as well? Continue listening and start speaking. And when you speak, don't worry about it. And the more you speak, the better you will get. Is the content or the method the cure for pro procrastination? The content, the content from Bangladesh. Okay.
at that it's been an hour and i'm gonna call it here so thank you all of you for listening and um yeah there's not many more of these left before the 90 day challenge is over so we'll see how far how, what we have achieved bye for now